Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Women of BSV. We've got today, we've got Ray from Molly Match. We've got Casey from Heartmail. We've got Robin Delissa all the way over in the States. We've got Ruth from Women of BSV, and we've got myself, Diddy, and we are joined by the wonderful Dr. Jack Rogers, who is a doctor of economics, who is at Exeter University Business School. He designed the programme for the FinTech course, or is the programme director of the FinTech course at Exeter University Business School. And he is also teaching Bitcoin to the startups for the Block Dojo in conjunction with Vionex. So welcome to the show, Jack. And Thank you. As always, what we like to do to start off with is literally to dive deep and just ask you who you are, what you do, which I've just said, and introduce us to yourself and your journey into Bitcoin. Yeah, thanks for the invite, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, I really appreciate it. It's uh, it was a bit of a mouthful introducing me, right? Because as, as, as we've been discussing, like I've been branching out from this kind of small universe in, in Exeter. And yeah, essentially my, my background is, as you said, in, in economics as a, as a lecturer. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Wait, well, is, where did you study economics? Yeah, well, here, here, um, everything's, okay. yeah. So you're from yeah, Exeter? Uh, no, I'm from near Bristol. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, but I did my first degree here in Exeter way back in the late nineties. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the stories around that, looking back related to Bitcoin, which I wasn't aware of. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, I love it down here, basically. So um, although I left for a while, I, I came back um, when the opportunity came up. Because uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's like even after this evening, I'll be down in Plymouth this weekend and trying to make the most of like being near the coast and everything so, so I mean, oh, oh, oh. well i'm going to chip in here because i've got friends yeah. in plymouth so make sure that if you cool. do go out to plymouth go to the blues bar and, and go and visit vince lee because he's like one of the best guitarists blues guitarists in plymouth that you will ever ever see seriously that's vince lee yeah. okay that, that, that's that's interesting, and, yeah. and oh actually as well there is alex hart as well you have to go and see alex hart because she's phenomenal and she's been touring martin bar from jeff roto Okay, that's that, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Some some of my family um, sort of connected to some of the the music stuff down there. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great it's a great scene as well for, for all kinds mm. of things, including music. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just a fun place to be. So yeah. Anyway, so I've I've stayed I've stayed in Exeter um, for a long time now. <laughs> um, and this thing with Vinex that you just mentioned, you know, it's it's only just happened very recently. So, so Robin, Robin Kutzer um, kind of invited me into the educational part of, of what they do, which is called Sato Learn or Sato Learn. It's kind of a tomato, tomato, American. I always go back and forth. I never knew how to pronounce it. Thank you yeah, for telling well, us. You, you, you put it like everything. You've got, you got to pronounce it how you, how you want to. But, but yeah, with, um, I'll call it Sato Learn, you know, it, it sort of started online, obviously, and it's, it's all the brainchild of Robin. Um, with somebody else who works with him called Adam. But yeah, essentially, I guess, you know, what, what I can bring to the table is just experience physically teaching in, in a room, um, which is kind of different. Obviously, during COVID, we've all had to learn um, how to do what I'm doing now, be comfortable just kind of in a in a Zoom room or whatever. But it, it is it is very different. I don't know, like we we tried to sort of, the last time I was there last week, we tried to make the most of doing like physical, Phys like a physical game all credit to robin i mean i don't know how he does so much um how he packs Thank so you. much in uh robin <laughs> robin, robin, okay, just to be clear. Robin. <laughs> robin delissa i happen to know is also incredibly busy yeah. <laughs> uh we've, we've had a few conversations lately on online uh but but no sorry robin i've got to say robin k now um robin, Robin Kurtzer, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. No, I don't know. Some people say cozy. cozy. But, but I have no idea. So I'm, Good question. I, I always said goes. I think I'm stagely and pronouncing as Coz. Robin Coz. Cozy. I don't know. Sorry, yeah, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> Robin K. You know, he, he does so much. I mean, have you, have any of you guys had any interaction with Robin K at all? We're um, hoping to get him on. 
the show. Yeah. I, I have invited him when he was in Dubai, but obviously he was on a plane at the time, I think. Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I love Finex, I love Satellan, I love all of his companies. I mean, he seems to be like, um, you know, a one-man multinational or something, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah we did go to the first... Um, Block Dojo event, and Robin was actually presenting at that event. So. Yeah. Cool, excellent. What was Casey showing us then? Something to do with bit stocks? No? Yeah, I just listened to uh, Robin Kay's interview with Michael Hudson um, oh, yeah, on yeah, yeah, stocks. Yeah. It was great. He's awesome to listen to. Doing He's some big yeah. so. And I love his sense of humor as well. He's got a very um, low key sense of humor. Dry. <laughs> Dry. Dry, yeah. 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 What, what are you exactly teaching though? It's like Sato how 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 is it constructed? Is it theory like Bitcoin theory, economics, history, what like coding? What what yeah, yeah. is it a bit of everything? Yeah. I, I I mean, you know, I'm very much the economist turned into this tech environment person mm -hmm. and they've already created something which is very focused on making it easy for anybody that's thinking about being a developer in the BSV space to just kind of make that switch over. So, so, so what they asked me to do to start with was create a course that sort of based on my experience teaching here at Exeter um, was a broader introduction to just Bitcoin in general. So I, I've, so there's an essentials course at the beginning, which I basically wrote like most of the scripts for, and then, you know, it goes through, you know, professional video construction and, um, Another thing that differentiates them is they have this kind of live coding thing on the, on the right hand side. So what you can do is you can um, just kind of experiment with adjusting a few bits of JavaScript or whatever, and then you can see the result appear straight away on the right hand side. But, you know, it's it's e easy for people to progress because essentially you can kind of just copy paste the answer in and bang, it works. So, yeah, I guess my... My role is introducing people. So imagine, you know, there must be developers out there that don't know anything about Bitcoin at all. It's probably, you know, less and less over time, but I guess that would be an ideal person to, to do the essentials course. But also, to be honest with you, m my personal objective is just educating people about Bitcoin in general as much as possible. So really, it's a sort of workhorse kind of course, just broadly hey guys, you know, there's this thing called blockchain that you've heard about. And then as they go into it, you know, they're, they're getting this kind of big perspective on Bitcoin as it was supposed to be. So do you find that they come in with like perceived sort of perceptions of what it should be and then actually they realise that it's nothing like what they think it is? Yeah. Are your students shocked? Yeah, I mean, so I, I can't tell you much about everyone that does the online course. You know, we get, we've gathered feedback where, where they give it, and it's generally very good. Um, but I can tell you, like, here at Exeter, you know, when I'm teaching, I mean, I, I started that Bitcoin module, and now it has 700 people lined up for next year. I, I started it in 2018, okay? okay. Uh, exactly the same time that we invited Craig to come to Exeter. So you, you can put the two together and work out sort of, you know, what was going through my mind. So... I um I would say to you to answer your question like yeah it blows people's mind by the time they finish my course I think that there's so much more to Bitcoin than just you know what what you hear about in terms of get rich quick investment and trading and um, of course young people especially <laughs> will always be interested in that number one. <laughs> Get like, can I just get rich really quickly, really easily? Um, get rich but, really quickly, really easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At, at the All same ages, time, yeah. okay. <laughs> I know. And, and surely lots of people already have and probably many more will um, in the future. But, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think people are surprised. And, you know, th th there's so many students here at Exeter who are doing a degree in the business school because it's open to anyone, not just an econ. So people doing management, marketing, accounting, finance, you know, all these different areas. So they're, they're, they're all invited to do the module. It's like an optional module. And so, yeah, as, as they join, they definitely have preconceived ideas, uh, for sure. And, and generally quite negative. But more and more people are hearing like, oh, there's this kind of successful Bitcoin module, you know, may as well do it. it sounds interesting. Bitcoin gets more... Uh, press over time, obviously. <laughs> and good work. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. Sure. So, is your curriculum focused on onboarding people to any of the stuff in the ecosystem, or is it solely for like developers that are wanting to build a platform or a product uh, in the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I should say my, my course at Exeter, and again, people have to keep in mind that get, getting approval for a, a 15 credit module, meaning 11 weeks of teaching, approximately two hours of lecture every week one hour of tutorial every other week, you know, that's quite a lot of material, you know, it, because it's in a business school, it's, it's definitely not been designed with sort of onboarding people into the development space. When I, when I first designed it, uh, to be honest, I, 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 knew, I knew so little compared to what I know now about things that you guys are involved in, right? All these new projects that are, that are being built in, in the BSV space. So long story short, I mean, basically, Half of it is just the history of money, <laughs> uh, quite dry and quite, um, but literally going back to like thousands of years BC, like once upon a time, you know, these people in Mesopotamia started using these clay tablets and recording things and transferring tokens to represent, you know, owning a keg of beer or something all the way through, you know, and it's, it's really cool because Bitcoin back then in my mind you know was was the next stage in the evolution of money so um then it moves on to yeah that there's obviously a big part explaining how bitcoin works right and that's the part which i keep honing over time and which very much i've integrated in terms of my interactions with robin uh robin k you know to, to try and figure out like right if, if people understand how bitcoin works at the same time as what it can do today then that's the best of, of what I can do in terms of what our students should should be doing, I think. So, yeah, so... No, it sounds terrific that you're putting it all in context with you know, in the history of the financial system. Yeah. I love the fact that you go so far back. Yeah, you, you do have history. to understand it. Do you teach them about the creep from Jekyll Island? About what? Do you teach them about the creature from Jekyll Island? Oh, I feel like I should know what that is. The, so there's a book by Edward G. Griffin. He's actually pretty big in the general cryptocurrency space as an influencer, as you know, someone that's written an amazing book about the true history of money and fiat fractional reserve banking, which is called The Creature from Jekyll Island. It should be um, required reading in your curriculum. Thank you. I'm just making a note. I mean, it's really interesting. Oh, it's a very interesting book. Yeah. I've read it, Ruth. I'd love to get um, G. Edward Griffin here on our on our show. There's actually. also a movie, Edgar, the uh, Jekyll Island. I forget what it's called, something Jekyll Island, but it's about the whole secret meetings and how they met on Jekyll Island to create the Federal Reserve and and how that. the Titanic was an inside job that <laughs> drunk all of the people. <laughs> that opposed the creation of the Federal Reserve. But yeah, it's a really interesting book. That is true, yes. In any case, it would probably make up a really big chunk because it's, it's a very long story, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about like what a, you know, a FinTech covers. Because like, I'm not even sure I know what FinTech broadly means. Yeah, good, good, good question. I'm, I'm really happy to answer. I mean, while Robin Delissa is with us as well, um, I, I'm not trying to catch you out, Robin, but like, in a, it's, it's interesting because in a way we're trying to achieve the same thing at the moment with um, sort of connecting to, to other universities. And yes. I mean, Robin, like, why don't you start by, by answering that question maybe? Like, what is FinTech? Because, I, and I really mean this, like, okay, so my understanding's the, evolved over time. Yeah, my layman's answer is, I've been a tech recruiter for two decades, right? So you had traditional finance and then you had traditional tech and over time, mm. things become hybrid. So tech has become this hybrid intersection with, with finance, right? And that, thus the advent of FinTech. And so you have more, instead of people just having traditional roles in, or at traditional industries that is just finance or just tech, it's the intersection of the two. So somebody, developers are now working on, you know, very advanced technical systems uh, for finance, would, like that could be an area of fintech, if you will. And then of course, with the advent of Bitcoin and, and blockchain in, in uh, 2008, then that's certainly an aspect of uh, the financial technology sector or fintech. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so like I even I even ask ask the students like on the fintech program, like one of their essays is like, what what is fintech? <laughs> um, so yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I'm just very honest about being very biased, like coming from a very specific place myself, because I I, I truly I genuinely believe. I mean. You know, technology and money and finance have just been evolving together over, over a long period of time. And, um, you know, f- I, I genuinely believe that the term fintech has sort of emerged in the wake of since 2009, you know, and I focus on the, 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 the smartphone and, and, and Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, probably some students think, oh man, you know, does it have to always be about blockchain? Uh, because they, they they want to do machine learning and, and we do we do that stuff as well. Um, You're like going to have to off... explain to us what machine learning is, by the way. Yeah, that's yeah. A big concept sure. in my head. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, absolutely. So, so I was just going to say, yeah. luckily, I've got a friend who who was all into machine learning, and and I actually wrote him in to help me design that part of one of the courses on the fintech program. Um, basically. Um, for, for me, it's it's just an extension of like, say, if I've got some data as an economist on um, the um, the GDP of or, or um, let's say share price or something, and um, I want to try and forecast it, so I've got some data, right? And then it's like, well, how do I estimate relationships in the data so that I can then um, make some kind of projection into the future, for example. Um, machine learning just kind of, I suppose, takes it a step further in the sense that the um, um, it's, you, you, can, you can sort of unstructure the way the computer is finding patterns in the data. Um, you can, you know, wh- whereas I might be thinking, right, here's data on people's height. How do I estimate the mean a- average height of everybody? you're kind of imposing some structure on what you're trying to find. Whereas with machine learning, it can just kind of look for patterns in um, oh. well, this unsupervised versus supervised learning. You know, there are all these different Point types of learning. Topic and say, go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, cool. and um, it, it might not work as well um, when you press go. It, it might not sort of converge. Um um, which, which which is a problem if your language is um, solidity, um, <laughs> but not a problem if your language is Bitcoin scripts. Um, <laughs> see what I did there? Um, yes, I did. Good one. Uh, but, can I interject? Yeah. I, would, I would say that it was uh, it's using algorithms and statistical models to analyze the data and draw patterns, and then the ultimate goal is is that computers are able to then teach themselves. It's an aspect of uh, data science and and it's an aspect of uh, artificial intelligence really because the idea is is the computer starts teaching itself and becomes smarter and smarter over time by recognizing those patterns and pre- and then doing predictive analytics to predict what will uh, come from that data. Interesting. I read an article the other day that one of Google's AI technicians says that he thinks that Google's AI is it's already sentient. Sentient. yeah. What do you think? And he got fired for it, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah, I mean, I, I was about to bring Craig into it actually, and so let me bring it, bring him in now. Please do. Um, yeah. He he would be like ex- expleting right now, probably um, after you saying that. <laughs> because, uh, well, you, know, you can ask what a Google engineer said it, not me. So I'm just exactly, quoting. exactly. You're just quoting. It's also, it's also the headlines today that that the smarter the AI becomes, that the more people will actually believe that it is sentient, and they may look at it as godlike, like it's it's headlining right now or trending but i'm sorry jack go on yeah no exactly yeah. but you know I, and again I, I don't want to disrespect anyone at all here but i i'm just and, and by the way sometimes I, I don't agree with craig as in csw i don't always agree with craig but there's so many things that i 100 percent do agree with him on um and one of them is definitely you know machine learning and ai y- yes it's it's part of human progress for sure um but it's it's the it's the area that has the most kind of danger, in terms of like people letting something loose that they don't understand, and misinterpreting what it's 
you know, the, the true value that it's bringing to us. It's it's easy to abuse. I suppose I suppose Bitcoin provably is easy to abuse as well. But there's something about blockchain for me which kind of it's like the antidote to, to the dangers of machine learning. You know, I mean, you know, there's 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 a few really smarter people than me in in the BSV space as well. Who um, I mean, I'm thinking of Ian Gregg. You know, uh, he he wrote this paper that sort of starts to speculate on how how you can put potentially machine learning AI sort of on top of on top of Bitcoin SV. And and I, I genuinely think that that sort of thing is is the only way we can get control of something that is almost already a bit out of control. What, why would it control it? What, what would be the advantage? Well, one one very, um, you know, and we, and we love conspiracy theories, right? So, so one, <laughs> one very real danger, surely everyone has to agree, is that if, if AI really does start to work in general form, general AI, I mean, that's really scary. So if Google or some, or some particular centralized company has kind of ownership or knowledge or, or something, maybe they already do, then, 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 then really um, there's pretty obvious dangers with that. So the only way I think you can stop that, and, and Ian's kind of speculated on this, is if you, um, you could use the BSV blockchain potentially, I think, and I'm way out of my depth here, but you could like have kind of dif- different, let's say different mach- machine learning algorithms running separately but kind of working together and, and reinforcing each other. So let's say I, I run something here, but but the data is all being recorded on, on chain, like like the results, everything that it's doing is, is happening, it's all being recorded. And then it's interacting with another, um, you know, another process or algorithm somewhere else. And if we can see everything and if it's all shared on one blockchain, and again, that, that, that repeatedly oh, so is the key to a lot of these things. Yeah. So do you know that it's not been fed, you know, not be manipulated like moral values or something like that without us knowing about it? Well, at least it. at least we can all see what, what what's going on because it's by definition in the, in, in the data is publicly domain. on chain timestamps, right? Yeah. So well, I think it's really crucial. Yeah. So I know yeah. a lot of people use uh, Lisp. Um, would that like work along with the blockchain? Lisp. Lisp. L L I S P. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 exactly. So I yeah. saw a compilation video the other day of human clone like things on all these like mainstream media outlets where they're talking and they look like a news anchor and all of a sudden the like body, the human kind of just like disappears or whatever. Yeah. Oh, it just right. like goes offline, like almost like they're using AI where we think that this news anchor should have some kind of moral compass within them, right? And like they couldn't possibly be lying to the masses. But when you start getting into this AI technology and really looking at what's happening, they could be using cloned humans to have like AI written speeches using the collective aggregated data of everybody online that like they're writing. And that's just, and that's just like the tip of it. Yeah, that's, that's just, just the tip. Of it, but if we have yeah. some kind of thing to verify like this content and this information and where it's coming from and who's I don't know, it's, it does seem mm. like it needs to be extremely addressed because when you start looking into some of the black ops technology stuff that they're using AI with, it is definitely yeah. part of controlling the entire global scene, the entire global scene. So that AI yeah, yeah, scary. podcast, it's- um, archaics is a really good influencer that's talking about this AI influence already that's running in the background of our entire global narrative. Uh, it, it is artificial t- intelligence, in my opinion, that's already running the show. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. There, there, there's no way we can know. I mean, but that's the thing, right? So, yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly well, if, why the big corporations need to be transparent about what they do. If um, Google's AI knows everything that Google has on its servers, it thinks it's sentient. That's a problem. It thinks it's sentient. Yeah. Well, and what's writing the speeches of these global leaders that is able to manipulate with such precise NLP and all the different like things that are coming through in these messages? Yeah. I've worked in the industry. I would say it's not nearly as advanced as 
as all that, uh, if they're still in the very beginning stages, but certainly that's that's where we're going. Did, did uh -huh. any of you guys see the film Ex Machina? Which Ex film? Ex Machina. I think it was called that. Just three words was that there's this female robot who displayed all the emotions of a person who was, you know, unjustly locked away right. and being abused and all this kind of thing. Mm. And I don't want to spoil it for people, but it was a great plot, obviously. Um, and at the end, uh, she turns on the guy who releases her and she leaves him trapped, uh, locked right. behind. And of course, has no remorse. So the, right. uh, the kind of the, the takeaway point for me was that these robots or AIs could become so intelligent they can fake human emotion to the point where we treat them as if they're human and feel mm -hmm. sorry for them, but they don't return the compliment. You know, they don't have pity or, or uh, you know, they, they can't feel what we feel. So um, it's, it's a really mm -hmm. interesting concept because we could be absolutely tricked into believing that these these intelligences that uh, feel have human feelings when they actually right. don't and that's typical well yeah well yeah exactly. beyond that is who's controlling the data who has the data you know jack uses the example of google and we don't want social networks or companies like google or amazon which by the way amazon knows everything about me between between my storing photos there for free, right? And what I watch and what I order and listening to me with Alexa, right? Like Amazon knows my entire life, right? But beyond that, like who controls the data? Like again, Jack gives the example of Amazon, but it's DARPA. I mean, who's like, which governments have that advanced AI and what is their intention behind it, right? That's, yeah, exactly. uh, I yeah. think, a, a different. Uh, Level yeah, so, so exactly, it's, it's both the data and, and the algorithms, but both of them. Um, and, and with the data, like, you know, you know, it's 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 also so it's two things. Like, it's about being clear about what the objectives are with, with all of this. You know, are we are we trying to benefit humanity versus some other strange girl? Um, you know, and that's what again what I like about Craig is that he always emphasizes the human being in all of this, mm. right? We come first, <laughs> and so you know, if if like collecting all of this data has a has an unhidden has a hidden cost as well, uh, which it does. You know, like things like Mechanical Turk and you know Recapture, like when you mm -hmm. uh, on Google you have to yeah. identify whether you're yeah. looking at traffic lights or something. They're just collecting data all the time because it's costly to collect, let's say, human decision made data. Right, that that's valuable, okay, and that's the un that's the hidden cost, the unseen cost in the background. So when when people are slaving away on Mechanical Turk um, for really really low wages, right, and then Google comes out and says, or whoever comes out and says, right, we've got this amazing machine learning thing, it does this amazing stuff. It's a bit like greenwashing and you know stuff where people are saying these wonderful things, but there might be these kind of hidden costs in in, in the background that they're not being very clear about. With blockchain, everything, like including what the miners do, is, is always transparent. We can always see everything that's going on really, really clearly. Like that's the key difference for me at every time. It's just how unbelievably transparent the whole thing is, which is really bizarre, right? Because everyone thinks Bitcoin is this all about like hiding. And <laughs> it's, it's like so ironic that it's the only technology we have today that publicly makes things transparent. Like That's there's right. no other technology that can do that. So That's right. just the irony is unbelievable. Inversion yeah. of reality is uh, a saying that I kind of like recently. Inversion of reality, because literally yeah. that's what we yeah. are being fed. Yeah. It's a real inversion of reality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stand like as why. There's so much hidden stuff going on. They don't want the transparency. So it's a perfect, uh, you know, under explanation for why there's so much disinformation and censorship. Uh, surrounding BSV. I mean, there's so much stuff going on that if the general public knew, they would be rioting tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to admit that over the past couple of years, I have seriously thought to myself that, you know, with the WEF and, and its great reset and all the kind of goals that they're trying to achieve, there would be the, the fact that all the things that are happening in the world are converging on socially engineering us and changing our behavior, you know, eat less yeah. meat use less energy, fly less, um, you know, uh, maybe don't own as many things, you know, so on and so forth. And you kind of think, it does seem to me like it's been war-gamed by an AI. Like if you had a list of 30 goals you're trying to achieve 
and you set an AI the task of getting us there from A to B, it would look pretty much like this. As Elon Musk says, we're living in the simulation. <laughs> the simulacrum. I'm telling you guys, there's a podcast all about this this specific topic called there's Archaics on YouTube. <laughs> he talks about the simulacrum and this AI X, the X factor of AI. And it's literally Ruth, like you hit the freaking nail on the head right there. Like it is AI that is frustrating at all. It's not some George yeah. Soros. It's not, you know, just some family or group or one, you know, small individual. It is literally technology driving this whole thing. What we're shown versus what must be underneath the surface that we don't right, know. Right, right. Sure. So, shit. You know? How old are your students, Jack? So the undergrads are in the final year. So they're like 21, roughly. Do they find all this a bit mind blowing? Like seriously, <laughs> like I mean, I'm I'm a really old person. I want to know what a 21 year old thinks about all. Well, they're just taking their stride because this is their world. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, yeah, I don't really know. Um, they're, they're definitely more familiar with stuff that older people are, are not um, used to thinking about. Basically, when I when I first saw Terminator, you know, I was blown away. But we are. We are there, <laughs> you know. I never imagined that Terminator would be something that would be, you know, like literally like, well, even possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Technology can race ahead quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I love that film. So, how many students do you have in your program, Jack? Tell us a little bit more about the program. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, so amazingly, um, there's 700 people signed up to the Bitcoin module for next year. That's awesome. In, in, in 2018, we, we we started with like, you know, 50 people in a room and it was just all purely experimental. And um, it's been amazing to see it. Obviously numbers grow for the wrong reasons as well, right? But again, it's it's an opportunity to, to open people's eyes. The, the, the FinTech program that I started, so it's now towards the end of its second year. Because of COVID, the university started letting students in in January, as well as October which has been a nightmare, to be honest. I've lobbied hard against it, and yeah, we're not going to do that anymore for next year. But but it's, it has allowed us to take in more. So as we speak right now, there's 40 plus 20. So there's 60 in total doing the FinTech at Exeter, the master's degree. Is that a year? And it's just one year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's cool because they come from... I mean, my, my other half runs the marketing masters they, they they're a massive program and a lot of them come from china what what's interesting here is that i'm getting sort of like a third from china a third from india and then a third from just random places including some you know from the uk which, which is unusual i mean the the master's degree market in the uk is it's quite a it's quite a strange thing really you know because it's just one year as well i guess a lot of people you know probably like in america i mean they they're, they're improving their English, it's a cultural experience. They're, they're doing it for all kinds of like reasons other than just getting training and education. So so they come from all over. But yeah, it's, it's cool. I mean, those people from like Vietnam, someone from Hungary, you know, it, it tends to be sort of Southeast Asia. Yeah, for whatever reason. But I'm hoping is to... It's a majority male. I'm quite intrigued. Good question. Yeah, it is a good question because... Economics is massively male dominated um, to this day. If anything, it's got worse over time, right? With the FinTech, I'm gonna say it's something like 65% male, I think. It's not, okay. it's nowhere near as bad as uh, economics. I would say that's like about the same ratio stuff. as the schools in the States. Yeah. 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 And again, many of our students coming from traditional finance or econo uh, economics degrees also. Uh, uh, Asia, yes, all over, but yeah. predominantly Asia. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 a cultural thing, and it's it's to do with circumstances that you see today in terms of why why they come and do it. But I, I really I really believe it's gonna it's gonna change. You know the 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 geopolitical forces at work. You know it's I, I already sense sort of it's been a lot of crazy things happening lately, and I don't know. I I, I think China. I think so. Let me put it like this. I think. The UK especially has really targeted and relied on too much on people coming from China. Um, and 
you know, it's it's worked up to now, but I don't think it's always going to work like that. So, yeah, I just kind of sense there's there's kind of change happening right now and it becoming a bit more of a sort of a global thing. I mean, there was someone from Mexico as well. You know, it's so rare that someone from the Americas looking at Ray and Robin there. It's so, it's so rare that people from the Americas and Casey as well. We'll, we'll have to start exchanging right. students with one another. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll create yeah, a program. Well, I mean, that's what I was going to Outside of this call, we'll definitely talk about this, Robin, for sure. Yeah, Casey, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, you know, is, is there any opportunity for you guys to get, you know, authorization from the students in class or whatnot to record these classes? And then you can also put them on, you know, some kind of online structure that people can go through them and, you know, the university and you can charge for that. One of the things I'm working on, which Jack and I have been meaning to talk about for a very long time, is creating a platform, whether it's on it's most likely will be on a job board, but creating a platform that's an education connection and it's to really tie the students with the professors, with the educators, with also employers, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's not just a job board where they're looking for to hire interns or looking to hire graduates, but there's a true communication platform and that can yield things like hackathons, challenges, right? Mm -hmm shared coursework, whatever, whatever that might be, but to empower each other because there's this huge disconnect. I'm like, okay, if there's only two schools in America teaching, or in the United States, I should say, teaching, you know, teaching in their, in their master's of engineering program, those schools should be tightly connected. The, the students should be tightly connected, right? To compare notes and, and work on projects together because they're trying to tackle the same problems and they're not, there's no connectivity. So if we can connect all of those people within that ecosystem, again, you know, professors, schools themselves, employers, students, the students, then we can create, we can really empower the entire ecosystem and empower the people learning and empower the companies building in those technologies. Well, I know there's other companies working on this stuff, but I definitely know that that also is very in alignment with some of the stuff that Ryan has uh, said he's very passionate about and he's building technology into Heartmail and the software down the track that would be able to meet the needs of what you guys are trying to do for this education structure. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. The technology already exists. Like this is a very easy thing to stand up. There's right now, one of the things I need to look at is the education network. So there's something called 10 that Jeremy Gardner started because Jeremy Gardner's claim to fame was that when he got stumbled upon crypto or Bitcoin, uh, at school was then he created an, uh, you know, like a student association group at a school and then he created them at all the schools. But I feel like that isn't really accomplishing today what it was, what it once was. And we need more of a grassroots thing that's voluntary. Nobody needs to have permission. The school doesn't need to have permission. I mean, right. The, the, their level of involvement, like Jack's involvement or Professor Lynn's at Duke is their choice whether they participate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. You know, Casey, like as well, like, um, in terms of, you know, online stuff, I mean, that, that that's, you know, more open, right? We, we, so I, I spoke to Xiaohui Liu um, recently, and if you, if you look at something like Escret, um, you know, we poten potentially, um, it's something that obviously you, you can sort of teach it as a, um, quite a pure academic thing right? in a way because it's a language it's in its own right okay but at the same time we could be moving into the area of what traditionally was called the MOOC the massive on online open mm -hmm. course and if you look at the top universities in in America um, they've always approached the MOOC thing like much better than we have in the UK because they've seen it as a kind of it's an advertisement for for, for why you should pay tens of thousands of dollars or pounds to, to go to go just for a year to, to, to do a degree so it's, it's like an advertisement but it's like an um let's say it's a, a showcased um segment of, of of your educational offering that you you make fun and, and you you give to the global community effectively for free right whereas like in, in the uk we i think in general um people have approached it wrongly and they kind of see it as a oh, we can do an online degree and charge money for it and make money. I mean, that's not really... <laughs> and, it, and it's interesting because it, it relates to BSV in general, this issue, because it's like, well, everyone's so used to everything being free online. Like, they can't even, like, comprehend the idea that you wouldn't just shove this on YouTube for free and just make it available to everybody, right? And, and then the practicality of how you charge for it. So it's interesting when you just said, Robin, about, you know, the technology exists for us to do something like this. I think, I think again, I'm very open-minded about 
you know, can we all team up and collaborate and make some kind of MOOC thing? But, may, but maybe you do charge a bit of money if people have invested time and effort in creating the course. Maybe and you should be able to charge individually per module. Or and, per and I wasn't saying for courses. So let me clarify. I was not saying for courses. I'm saying for a platform where the everybody can engage with one another, not courses themselves. So let me let me be very clear about that. Okay, got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That's 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 interesting. Yeah, on, on a platform. At the moment, university is a huge investment of time and money. Yeah. And I, I worry for my own kids who are just going to come into that university age soon. Mm. Like, is it worth it still? What do you think? I mean, I, I know you work for a university, so it's probably things you shouldn't and opinions you shouldn't yeah. shouldn't have. But, you know, it, 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 what, are, what are students getting these days over and above what they could find online? Yeah, I mean, it's inevitable that, that we talk about this all the time, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think, um, like... I don't know sort of how old people are here, but I did my degree in IT, so I was so lucky here in the UK because um, the circumstances, basically I got my whole degree paid for plus plus a grant. You know, I'll never forget the cheque rolling in to the bank and thinking, wow, like I've got all this money, like straight to the pub, you know. Um, amazing how lucky, like honestly, and I feel bad saying that. You but it's amazing how lucky we were. Eh? You don't look old enough to have had a grant. <laughs> I did. I did. I had a full. I had the full grant. Like I arrived. I arrived at Exeter in 90, 1995. and um, yeah, basically compared to today. So obviously, I've watched the nature of the degree change from then to, to what it is yeah. today. Now, now I'm teaching, and like apart from just the sheer ridiculous, crazy numbers of people, it's. I suppose it's interesting because some some things have not changed. Like it is, it, Exeter does have a reputation as being a kind of people coming from Surrey, Oxbridge reject type, you know, basically posh rich people come come to Exeter. But but what's interesting, what what's interesting is that like let's say about forty percent, you know, to this day are still not from that type of background. So I guess where I'm going with this is it's kind of like a rite of passage, uh, a very expensive one, right? <laughs> and and I guess the key is, and of course I'm biased, but I would say this, but. You know, you, you, you've heard about my Bitcoin module now at Exeter, right? And so there are lots of different degrees you, you could do. Some are going to give you more transferable skills than others. It, it is a place for me where young people for the first time are physically away from home and just thinking things through for themselves and discovering what they think they're good at doing and stuff. But I'm also fully aware that, you know, other cultures closer to the UK, like, for example, in Germany, don't look at it as a kind of, you know, you're a failure if you don't get a degree. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, if you did an apprenticeship and you're good at this, you're successful and it's a completely different trajectory and that's respected more than it is here. So, yeah, there's no clear answer to your question, Ruth. Like, but I guess I go back to what Craig often says as well, which is, you know, it should be about both training and education. There should be an element of, like, um, theory time to philosophize and think about things, but also a pra pragmatic like set of, you know, well, maths is quite useful, or, you know, if it's a marketing degree, you know, you're, you're, you're learning, uh, you're getting guest speakers in from big corporations who share how they actually use the theory for real, stuff like that. I think a degree yeah. still pays for itself in general, especially here in the business school, but at the end of the day, Craig wants schools to teach people how to think, not just give them vocational skills, but teach them how to think, regardless of the subject, right? Like, that's really kind of the foundation of it all. For sure. I did a, a, tra a, a training course, like a youth training scheme course, and I did a degree and I did an online degree. And I can tell you that doing the, the actual courses themselves and having to actually physically go somewhere and meet someone is far better and more constructive a way of learning than just being online i love yeah. doing stuff online but there's something inherently missing about online courses you still need a human interaction um and i must say like like i say no matter how much i like doing my degree and my masters which was online and that's a, a you know a 
place in Ecuador. I did a physical physical degree here at a place called Intermedia, but just being able to use equipment and actually talk to someone and see a studio and a TV, you know, that was necessary to actually physically be in a new in a different building because of mm-hmm. what it was and the same with the training I did like sound and lighting in the theatre so I worked in a theatre there's no way you could replicate that online so certain things they really do need to be physical the one thing about the training course was though I got the practical skills and I got all the experience I needed but I did not get the theoretical learning that I should have had and that's what I had to do later to do a degree at uh, intermediate film and vi- TV film and video to get the, the because I was stuck for ages like 16 years you might have the training and the skill and the experience but you don't have the qualification and that always held me back whereas now it, it, it's it, it's not like that at all so you know yeah. there is but I still think there is a difference you are still looked at if you do have that qualification and you do have a piece of paper it just says you applied yourself to a course you still get a little bit more respect than if you've not um I absolutely that experience from doing well, all three well look, look at the example of the block dojo right in in London so they insist on that being face to face I mean it's an incubator for tech startups but they, they have to physically be there. And, and you know, I don't know if this is too much information, but, like, the, the bottom line is I know from talking to different people that actually, and, 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 and I experienced this myself, like, the people that actually attend face-to-face, everything. You know, some people are just keen. They're just, they, they want to they wanna do this properly, you know. And it does tend to be those people that do the best. You know, they, they literally go to everything. They attend everything. They participate. They ask questions. They go for it, and it's and again, it's face to face. But but you know that's not to say that online training isn't um, incredibly useful, efficient, and so on, and, and allows people to connect, you know, across the world like like we are now. But yeah, I I, I definitely I'm again I'm biased. I mean I've been doing this for years, like so. I'd sort of take it for granted, really. And COVID was such a shock. <laughs> it was such a shock. I mean, I've got really used to just being here in this room now. But I've got to say, like, we were we were pretty freaked out. I mean, it was it was like Armageddon. It was like, you know, yeah. just that, the full the first full lockdown. And university, it's like, are universities even going to survive this? Like, is, this, is yeah. everything going to be different? I guess, yeah, it can seem quite dramatic when it's suddenly taken away, the, the face-to-face element, completely. Um, and, it, and I have to say that the, the most recent cohort we've had from January, okay, there's only 20 of them. So you get to know them. Um, they, they've had me quite a lot. And I know them all by name, like really easily, like more than just by name. I kind of know a bit about them and stuff. And so I know the personalities a bit. And so there's this like, and again, Craig's been talking about this, you know, once you get beyond classes of 25, 30 and beyond, whether it's face to face or, or online, to be fair, but but even more online, if you're just in a Zoom room with 200 people in a Zoom call. Hi, hello, everyone. No one turns a camera on, right? Um, you can't, and you can't force them to. And so um, basically, you're just a guy in a room, just talking, and you may as well just have recorded it and posted it, quite frankly. But you know, obviously, the live thing, you know, is. It's kind of nice, but yeah, I'm I'm a great fan of, of face-to-face teaching, but but where possible, outside of this, you know, collaborating well, in the way that we've talked I really about with Robin. Look forward to seeing how people like you and Robin and these professors can come together and gamify learning using BS. Um, that should 100%. be transformational as well, and really um, driving that engagement in some kind of live video by somehow gamifying and incentivizing people to be more active, um, I think would be really, really awesome. I wanted to ask, um, from a marketing standpoint, I watched this Coin Geek video about Bionex, the brand in focus, and there's some little clips in there of like younger children looking at your uh, curriculum and stuff. Do you guys have anything for younger people outside of college age in your curriculum in your program or is that just part and who made this video i was going to ask your your website your marketing like your uh online presence is amazing so uh yeah. you know just curious who you guys used for help with that or if somebody in-house is 
the mastermind there and what um so, so so you were just showing a vionex video yeah yeah it's was the it Queen Geek, super short uh branding focus and it's yeah. only a minute made by i don't know who made the uh the little video there but it's really good yeah. and yeah it, it appears like from first glance that it's got some information about younger people consuming that cool. curriculum as yeah. well. so uh, i you know having a young son at 13 years old trying to funnel him into uh mm -hmm. this space i was just curious if that was on your roadmap if yeah. not already in play so well the, the, the only thing i can tell you is i remember about 10 months back we we had a, a conversation um mm -hmm. which i was invited to around you know collaborating so that we could create stuff specifically for for children who normally just learning how to code at, at really young ages in my opinion horrifying the young ages to be learning how to code but i suppose coding is just kind of it's just yeah. kind of like writing now Same um, it's like a but, language but yeah. for kids though i think the younger the better uh you know introducing mm. them to that kind of stuff from what yeah, i've heard sure, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, uh, absolutely. Yeah, no harm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know any more than that, Casey. It's probably only just come out. You make a good point as well, Casey, and I'll, I'll bring it up because uh, it's not normally, certainly not on my mind. Um, you know, I've, I, I'll be honest, like, like I taught first year econ for many years. Um, so they're 18 when they arrive. I mean, I, the, so we, we, we've got family who teach at secondary school. The, the idea of teaching, you know, people younger than that, it, I find it terrifying because <laughs> it's, it's a very different skill set, I think. Me um, too, with trying to homeschool my 13 year old son, I'm sitting here like he's on a full online program and it's just, it's really hard to keep him interested and motivated to do it. But, you know, trying to find something to spark that entrepreneurial spirit within him now and show them like yeah. you can make money online or you can i i know that it's going to take a monetizational incentive to get them like really excited about it i can do what you know what i mean so um right now it, it's the games and the social aspect of interacting with his friends on the games that got him hooked because of that social thing but if somehow we can gamify the learning about these things with other kids his age that's why i was talking about you know getting him into some kind of study group with with kids in the you know crypto fights or haste arcade uh you know communities that are starting to form now but we still got to teach them how to actually build like a business and not just be gamers so maybe we can I, ask grace uh daughter here what she thinks about building a business uh, yeah are you having fun watching your mom play molly match so so ray ray can you hear us yeah. Ray, can you hear us? Yeah. Um, Ray's daughter. Yeah. What do you think about building a business with Bitcoin? So what do you think? Do you think we're going to make, make some money with Molly Matt? Uh, kind of, maybe. <laughs> Are you having fun watching your mom create that? Mm-hmm. So you have That's to get Molly, the help. Molly and the cats. Yeah. Do you own a cat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, she's awesome. watching us right now. She's staying cool. <laughs> we're outside. Inside. Yeah, we're outside. She's inside. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're enjoying the birds. <laughs> yeah, she. <laughs> I, I honestly think just teaching kids about money would be a great place to start. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the history of money mm -hmm. with kids, as, uh, you know, like secondary school age, that would be so valuable. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it. And it's Even so before secondary school age would be quite good. Did she? Did you, like, my money is. Yeah, she's seven at the moment, but she's, you know, she's got the little shop till and she's got this and she's got that and she pretends that she needs, you know, thing, you know, give me some plastic money for a banana or whatever, you know, plastic banana, piece of cake. But yeah, to be able to kind of teach them properly about economics would be a good thing. And finance. And I, I, I remember yeah. economics A level and um, I remember our economics teacher t teaching us that managing the managing the economy's budget was not like man managing a, a household budget it was okay to be in debt and you know it was quite different but she never really got and dug into why though i mean I, I i got the gist of it that like it it didn't matter that countries are all in debt to each other matter being relative term but you know um it, but she never really explained that money is debt mm. 
in in most countries in the world. So that would have been really helpful just for a yeah, start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I, I I could talk about this all day long. I mean, it, and it's yeah. <laughs> But I, I completely agree. I mean, there, uh, right, there's so many examples of things that people should be learning when they're really young at school. Um, you know, like university aside, I mean, just life skills, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, it's, it's bizarre Compound that... Interest. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we, we gave a program um, called Scratch. You ever heard of Scratch? Yeah. Yes. For kids? We do a little yes. bit of that. And that's a good starter because they're learning... Um, you know, programming on how logic works and it's, you know, yeah. Python. And then when she gets older, then she can do, you know, the other harder stuff, I think. Um, to probably are are, you, are you into programming yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, she's um, a <laughs> yeah I'm so, learning um, Python mainly. Um, I'm more of a system person though. Like I was raised on Linux. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. So, you know, your um, influence is already uh, Showing up. Yeah. sort of, um, yeah, taking fruition. I mean, that's the thing. You're, you're very often inspired by, by what your parents do to some, some degree, I think. Um, but I, I was just saying that, yeah, basic life skills, there's a list of them. And it's kind of silly that, you know, just some time isn't dedicated to, to those things. Um, and, and with money, I mean, it's like, I, I dipped into the Metanet Slack the other day and I saw some people talking about just what you just said, Ruth, kind of the thing of money being debt or whatever, and or, or, or actually, you know, missing that idea. So the thing is, is like, I, I hate to repeat the phrase, you know, two sides of the same coin, but there's, there's always two ways of looking at the same thing. So like the physical cash in your pocket, you know, on one hand, it's a token that people can use in a decentralized way. doesn't matter, right? No one needs to witness you doing your trade with each other, whatever. But then on the other hand, it, it's it got a serial number. It's issued by the Bank of England, and it actually appears as debt on the Bank of England balance sheet. <laughs> so it's in fact, it's the only, along with reserves that the banks hold, it's the only form of debt that the central bank has that you know, allows it to control like the money supply sort of in indirectly. And, and, and a big misconception actually is that, you know, banks, it's, it's the banks that really control the money supply because when a bank makes a loan to you, they, they enter into a legal arrangement with you, but money appears magically in your account that the person who's borrowing the money, like if you've ever bought a house or, you know, got a mortgage, money just suddenly appears in people's accounts that wasn't there before at that moment. So although right. it sort of eventually ties back to real money. <laughs> Theoretically. It's, it's all debt, it's all debt sort of floating around. Which of course is why raising interest rates like they've done today is so, such a big deal because that, that will put people off from getting out, taking out mortgages, which will shrink the money supply. Exactly. Well, and then you know the fractional reserve <laughs> banking, you know about that too, right, Jack? Well, this, this, is, this is the system I'm touching on, yeah. I mean, fractional reserve yeah. banking. Well, it's it's a system that we've inherited through lots of strange historical struggles between different people. <laughs> okay, and, and and but you're absolutely right. The, the, the amazing thing is, is that, and, and I really mean this. Before I'd even heard about Bitcoin, I was already teaching people that if anything, that you know, I have this slide with this kind of pendulum of power that swings around between, you know sort of centralized, you know, the, the, the monarch, the, the different institutions, right, um, compared to just the people on the ground doing trade with each other. And actually, if anything, today we've got this sort of compromise um, structure where, um, you know, the government, you've got the government saying to the central bank, right, we will let you control the currency um, as long as you manage our debt. You know, and obviously there's way more to it than just that. But in terms of the basic power dynamics, that's basically it. And it doesn't have to be like that. And even way before Bitcoin, people were talking about plain money systems. So systems where like a pound is a pound in the sense that it's not fractional reserve banking anymore. It's um, you, you try and separate the payment system from um, I've got some excess savings. This institution called a bank is allowed to 
hold my savings and lend out only my savings. It's not allowed to make a loan based on some vague ratios in terms of its overall balance sheet. And that, you know, people say if you have that system, there's less money um, available for entrepreneurs to, to, to borrow, which is also true. But I mean, a long time ago, again, you know, a, a wiser man than me was saying, maybe one day the payment system will completely separate from the, let's call it the mutual funds savings function of finance channeling you know savers excess savings towards productive resources the, the, the amazing thing about today is that with crowdfunding you know ev even that sort of relationship can break down as well and become decentralized meaning you know it can become more um i would say transparent again it's like well if you're crowdfunding what could be more transparent than yeah. that you yeah. know I mean, we've right. By the way, sorry if anyone wants to say something right now, but I've got to say this right here in Exeter. Right, I didn't know this until a few years ago. There's a company called Crowdcube, mm -hmm. and I mean, they they blazed a trail in this thing called crowdfunding many many years ago. I mean, I'm going to say 12 years ago. I, I don't know. It's a long time ago. And I met I met this guy recently um, called Darren Westlake, who, who started it all right here in Exeter, and he um, he he actually was responsible for pushing UK government and helping them, you know, move in the right direction in terms of just easing the regulations so that um, so that they can do what they, they, they can do. And I, I don't know where they are right now in terms of branching out to, you know, America and um, and Europe, um, which, which are both on their radar. But I think the crowdfunding thing is, is a really interesting concept. You know, the, the expertise around advising people on what to do with their money should always be respected and the big institutions still have more people with more expertise. But I do think that Bitcoin with crowdfunding and yeah, machine learning, whatever, but, that, but those things are kind of pushing us like forward into like a new transparent uh, era of just allowing, you know, you and me to shove a pound in, right? Just a pound yeah. into a company that you fancy. Yeah. Um, I think that's fantastic. You yeah, know, it is it's fantastic. About transactions costs. Yeah. And society as a whole is, is demanding more accountability and transparency, right? Even in, in corporate and in, in everything. So yeah, I agree. But crowdfunding yeah. specifically, the ability to for the average Joe to invest in something. So it, maybe it doesn't make a financial impact, but they were able to at least vote with their money, right? At any scale. Exactly. Yeah. Ex exactly. And it forces the bigger financial institutions to think about how they have to change the, the yeah, same way Bitcoin right. has forced them to think about their payment systems. Right. Um, it's 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 already changed what they do. So, so let me pick your brain, cool. Jack. Yeah. It's the current financial state that we're in. What happens <laughs> next? Um, oh boy. Because you know. Well. That's a big question. I mean. I mean, I'm not like going for accurate detail or anything, but like. That's that's like saying a theoretical physicist should know what the weather's going to be in a year's time. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I mean, but fair enough. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would say is, you know, like the, the only thing we can do as economists meaningfully is sort of talk about general trends mm -hmm. and then talk about the very short term, um, the, the near future, meaning the next few months um, or the next year, say. Um, because, yeah, and, and to answer your question, uh, I mean, we're, we're clearly going into, and I'm saying this from a, a UK perspective right now, a really bad, <laughs> really bad phase. It's a sort of perfect storm, really. Uh, I mean, Ukraine, you know, the price of oil, like there's nothing, these are external things to your... Let me just ask that. Global yeah. supply and, shortage, yes. But we money supply, right? whilst everyone was furloughed to pay for the furlough, whilst everyone was at home. And then the way I see it, the interest rate has to rise to meet the increase in money supply to correct the ratio. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and if, and if it does that eventually, which it must, I think, what happens then? Look, I, I, I think the same way as when I talked to Craig about this stuff, I, I think, you know, you, you were born with a more Austrian perspective. I was born with a more Austrian perspective. 
And I think the reality is somewhere in between the two ways of thinking. Um, so what I mean by that is I think you're right that when a government prints money or, you know, does something that makes things easier in the short term, uh, there is kind of a price to pay of some kind further down the line, right? But saying that, you know, and I'll stand by this in front of Craig and, and anyone. I, 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 I'm, yes, I'm a trained Keynesian economist, but I stand by the notion that, you know, if, if you believe in your democratically elected government to represent your people, and if you don't, there are there's some serious problems. I mean, then, then we have to step into sort of, you know, anarchy and things. But if, if you believe that they could at least potentially help the economy or manage the economy, then the best thing that they can do is commit to some kind of long-term borrowing commitments. And that's, and that's the key problem. That's the key problem. So, so, so like, you know, the Bank of England was made independent, right? And, and set a single goal, basically, inflation targeting, right? You could, you could have done the same thing with the fiscal authority. So with, with spending and taxation, overall policy, right? How much is the government spending versus how much is it bringing in in tax? I mean, the balance between those two things, like changes whatever you do over time. And the question is, is how do you in the long term balance the books, right? How do you make sure that happens? The, 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 they haven't solved that problem because governments come in in rough, roughly five year cycles and there's basically an, an upward debt bias, um, which is like a general long term problem. So as a Keynesian, I would say the government is right to try and ease things during a recession as long as it actually goes back and tries to build up savings yeah. properly Turn when times are good the economy. And, and, and that it's committed to that somehow. Um, and, you, that's, and that's a difficult thing. Did you see the Bank of England said that they were going to take over stable coins? Oh, God. Again, you know, stable coins. I mean, I'm so, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so shit? glad. I'm so yeah. glad I asked Craig directly this question. I, I asked him the other day. I was like, Craig, like, is there a reason for any stable coin to exist whatsoever in your mind? And he was like, no, of course not. I was like, oh, thank God, I'm not going crazy. And I know people often disagree with Craig. I do sometimes, but I mostly agree with him, as I said. And I, you know, for ages, I've been thinking, why, why does everyone keep talking about stable coins? The only reason why they exist, in my mind, is because in the short term, regulation hasn't caught up with Bitcoin. So yeah. the, there are all these and exchanges swabbing, where swabbing everyone in the short term, to shove yeah. their money between... And, and because everyone's just using Bitcoin for trading and the other cryptos, they need easy places to park their money where it's safe in fiat relative to some kind of stable asset, basically. But without the transactions cost of selling back into dollars, right? I mean, you know, it's it's just a short term. It's like ICOs. It's, so it's like... They're taken out of the exchange more than anything. That's the real reason for them because they don't really exactly. want to have to come up with the actual... I would argue for transactions, like not just trading, but for transactions. If, if we want merchants to take Bitcoin, they're not ready. We're not in a society that's able to hold that Bitcoin. They need fiat currency. And so they need to be able to swap it. It's the swapping aspect of it. It's using it for transactions as yeah. well, right? I, I do. I do appreciate that there's a practical need um, to be able to easily you know, switch your, your Bitcoin as a merchant when you receive it straight into yeah. a stable coin. I mean, I, right. I get that. But I'm just saying, you know, if if regulators are caught up with Bitcoin properly, it, it would be just as easy to switch exactly. straight into dollars. I agree. I don't think you, the first real stable coin will be the US the, or the CBDCs, really. I mean, that will be the real stable coin. It, or, like, <laughs> they're not stable anyways, right? It's... <laughs> I think it's just a shell game, exactly. right? I think that stable coins, as they're used at the moment in exchanges, is a shell game. It's a way to not have to like demonstrate that the money is not really there by turning it back into pounds and dollars. Because if you did turn it back into pounds and dollars, it would be very apparent very quickly that the money isn't really there. Yeah. So it's a wonderful way of moving the shells around and obscuring exactly. the fact that the valuations of absolute bullshit yeah 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 i think it's so ironic um and again i'm not knocking anyone that's maybe even behind a stable coin project right now uh, because of what i just said because of regulations today but i mean there's definitely an irony that it's like people go back to the previous system like very naturally right 
because stablecoin is exactly a fractional reserve banking system again, <laughs> depending on how you do it. And, and people say, oh, algorithmic stable coins, it's all very clever. Sorry, I mean, it's it's ridiculous because, you know, gl global finance, right, every single day, trillions of dollars worth of money exchanges between one currency and another, right? So the volumes of money that push individual currencies up and down every single day are just absolutely unimaginably immense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the only way the, the, the modern fractional reserve banking system works is because globally, the big central banks, they all work together as well. So, you know, the, the story I always give my students like, is with Japan and the tsunami and basically insurance money and lots of funds rushing into Japan, but from dollars exchanging into Japanese yen, pushing the yen up. And so you've got this like appreciation exchange rate just at the worst time for Japan, which will plunge it into a terrible recession. So basically all, all the G7 and others just all got together and said, right, we're going to sell our reserves of Japanese yen. And the moment they made that statement, this is the critical part, right? The moment they made a credible statement about what they were going to do, all of the Goldman Sachs guys start selling their yen again and stop pushing the yen up because they, they, they play ball because it's always one power versus another. So it's Goldman Sachs, i.e. the whole financial industry, everyone trading versus governments all collectively that mm. crucially have to have unlimited control of the money supply. If they didn't have that, right, they, everything would just be total chaos or, or it wouldn't, no, I shouldn't say that. It wouldn't necessarily be chaos because I'm aware that I've got more Austrian leaning people here. <laughs> Um, it wouldn't necessarily be complete chaos, but it, it would, the system would change and be a lot less managed by government. And there would be more volatility of fiat currencies in terms of the, their underlying real value, which, which may be fine. And I think Craig probably still thinks that's fine as well. You know, he, he, he's changed over time, but he, he has Austrian roots in terms of the way he sees the economy. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. You know, I'm coming from a different angle. But I, I just think that, we, you know, when people are talking about stable coins as a kind of long-term thing, that, that, doesn't make any, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's a bridge towards uh, a future where we're all going to be able to easily exchange one day between fiat currencies. And they, and they will compete. I mean, I, I do believe that one day um, a version of Bitcoin uh, won't be subject to speculative trading. Anymore. Exactly, and I it agree. Will just stabilize and and it's a very and it, and it'll be better solution. than dollars. Yeah, I, I truly, I truly believe yeah. that's one day going to happen. Just well, well, yeah, might take a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's going to take a long, long time. But you know, we're we're on this kind of journey, and and there's no going back. You know. Yeah, that's but there's thing. too many people behind nothing can stop it it's a better system yeah. it's better for humanity at large so as the technology Definitely. gets more and more evolved it, it's the cheaper smarter faster answer right and there's so many 100%. but, but it, it's just a better system everybody's going to adopt the better system 100 percent. and i wish more people knew this um, yeah. including in government here, including... That's why we're all here, right? Is to try and open more eyes. <laughs> Definitely, 100%. Yeah. And, and as a bridge as well, to say to them, well, you're very welcome to issue pound sterling as de denominated in individual pennies as a token on top of Bitcoin SV. There's no problem with that, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, just using it as a, as a data carrier and paying the miner that tiny yeah. fee to do a transaction what's i mean what's wrong with that i mean we make all the systems work together so much better as well yeah yeah more transparent you know yeah. the, the 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 decision making um everything can be more transparent and it can all be more efficient i i, um, I know people think I i'm crazy Austrian, but i am i am mildly keynesian in, in as much as i <laughs> i think that if governments would spend more of their uh, tax revenue and investing back in their country and in the infrastructure of the country, yeah. then a lot of these problems would go away. Definitely. They're not really doing that properly. No. Right. They, you know, um, we've got a conservative government right now, and they're not big on that. Um, they want to yeah. store it all in the financial sector. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, there, there needs to be some some balance brought back and some forethought and care. I yeah. Think. 
And and while we've got like Americans and Brits in the same room, I mean, it's interesting um, to, to compare the approaches of the government because I mean, I mean, with Bitcoin, you know, going back to Bitcoin, because it's like, do, I mean, I saw there was an MP here in the UK recently, funnily enough, promoting the idea of stable coins just before Luna. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is hilarious yeah. um and yeah so so but at least she was you know coming out and saying guys you know we we should make the UK like a, a oh, yeah. hub and, and this this thing called yeah. cryptocurrency like it's not it's not this bad thing but I, I don't know I mean they smell I, do you think our approach at the moment under the current conservative government is sort of pro enough to because I'm quite surprised at how I just don't think that they know enough. I, I just don't think our MPs are up to speed. Like, they don't know. I, they I think that you to teach them. Yeah. Right. I think that it, I think that people are intelligent enough to realize that it's inevitable. And I think that there are starting to embrace it a little bit more but i think that they need to they, know, they need to know they need to figure out solutions around it regardless like one of my objectives is to try and help educate smart policy with regulators in america right because people that might have been making decision or having an influence in the past really had limited extremely limited knowledge people in rules today still have limited knowledge but maybe a little bit more than a year or three years ago right and so the more educated they are as they move into these roles to create policies right the better the better we can build smart policies that are proactive and proactively building a better ecosystem to empower businesses and consumers to use bitcoin right when when we have the g8 actually adopt you know um central bank digital currencies then in my mind then we hit moore's law right like people start using it start using it start using it when you have g8 actually teaching their citizens to use a digital currency you hit peak adoption that in my mind, and I'm sure there's lots of arguments around that. But when you have the G, when you start building smart policy, and you have the central banks building digital currencies, in my mind, the, the average Joe now says, "Oh, I get it. This is just electronic cash, right?" Mm -hmm. I don't oh, know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But digital cash, which if if it was issued on top of Bitcoin SV, um, could be technologically um fused with automating and illustrating a lot of processes transparently right. so right. that everything you do now is just much better i mean so much more efficient and more accurate and more transparent and traceable yeah. it's, yeah. so, it's, it's just such, such a non it's just yeah. with, um, imperial college london because i like robin is 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 he not cambridge based He's Cambridge-based, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so is it just the fact that, because obviously the government advisors come from specific universities, and I know for a fact, obviously, Cambridge, Oxford and yeah. Imperial College London specifically is one of those that they turn to, and they, yeah. a lot of their advisors come from Imperial College. So does it, is that basically a barrier as well? It's just that there are people in the wrong places not hearing the right noise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope we I hope we change that over time. I mean, it's a good point, you know, the elitism thing with universities. Um, I, you know, there's, there's there's a few sort of mysterious connections between Exeter and Bitcoin that I haven't mentioned um, up to now. But it, it makes me okay. I'll say I'll say in a second then. Yeah. Okay. So, mysterious. <laughs> it is mysterious. <laughs> I mean, everything about Bitcoin's emergence is mysterious, right? Oh, yeah. But you know, I, I sometimes wonder if there's something in the air in different geographical places. I mean, so I, I don't know where Robin Casing Ray are based in America, but like, you know, I've traveled in America and you do sense like, as you go from one place to another, that there's surprisingly different kind of cultures. And it's the same here. Um, like Diddy, where, where actually are you, by the way? Um, I'm in Nottingham. So, yeah, Nottingham, so I'm, so I'm Nottingham, 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 which yeah. is Midlands. So it's not I'm, North, I'm, not a yeah. Northerner. I'm, I'm which, Michigan, but Robin Hood is is obviously from Nottingham. So everybody yeah. knows of Nottingham because of Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham, you know, Little yeah. John and blah, blah. So that's where I'm from. So we have yeah. a culture up here of because um, of Robin Hood, Robin the Rich to pay the poor so the poor <laughs> can actually live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, it's really interesting, right? And and I do, I, I, I really mean this. Like, I think culturally... So, so Imperial, being in London, um, 
we'll have a certain culture and a certain embedding of you know the city like the, the big finance thing um with it whereas here in exeter I, I i genuinely believe that there's sort of a bit more of a freedom to think i know that sounds a bit weird i mean you know we don't have a lot or, of or maybe just a more diverse in the thinking than yeah yeah the mass. So there's, there's something about the physical place i i really believe that so close to the ocean um, that's there's one there's, <laughs> that's gotta be it <laughs> yeah well there's, there's one guy um called sajid javid who's um sort of top of the current government um i am losing track of what his role is now i think he's um it's kind of embarrassing that i'm, I'm even saying that but you know, ch <laughs> chancellor right chancellor the exchequer um but like with you know apart from him there are not many examples of people going into government at the top level um from exeter um jk rowling uh, as an author is, is a famous person that graduated from exeter so again you know maybe there's something about places that are more in the in the regions um away from london where there's a bit more um distance from the, let's say the mainstream like in america if you're a long way from uh, Wall Street, or if you're a long way from California, things are different, basically. So I, I believe that's the case here. And yeah, I, I alluded to this mysterious connection with Exeter. Um, I, I, I don't know if you, you must know this, surely. There's someone called Adam Back, uh, oh, cited Adam on the Beck. Bitcoin white paper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, oh, amazing, I right? So, so he was he was literally right here at Exeter when he when he published his stuff, right? So he so he was active on cryptography, mailing lists, um, in, in a range of different things, I think. But the thing he's obviously famous for today, of course, is some kind of proof of work based suggestion for stopping spam, basically. And then and then hinting that, oh, you could maybe use this as the basis for for money, amongst, you know, other people that were suggesting similar things, but not based on proof of work. I I I've never really I sense that Craig doesn't necessarily want to tell the whole thing uh, just yet, but I, I, I putting sort of two and two together, I think the fact that Craig's often mentioned someone called David Reese as well, mm -hmm. um, he was friends with his grandfather going right back as a sort of inspiration and an influence on, on Craig. David Reese was like the head of Econ here at Exeter, sorry, the head oh. of Maths here at Exeter for like decades, I think, like a long, long time. And, and he, he passed away in his 90s, say seven years ago or something. But there's there's definitely some sort of strong link there. And um, I, I can only imagine that one of the reasons why he got hold of Adam might have been something to do with at least being aware of Exeter, you know, that it existed kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's kind of weird. Um, well, how just did knowing you that, about Craig? How did, you, how did you and he meet? Because that's random as well isn't it yeah so it's only because um i was supervising so I'd, i've been getting more and more into bitcoin over time in my econ teaching so before i launched the module in 2018 the reason why i invited craig to come to exeter um was because of sebastian plotzenader so he's this austrian guy who now works for Enchain still and um introduced me really to it's like, it's like I was already teaching people a bit about Bitcoin, but it was kind of like a side note to what I did. But because I was supervising his dissertation and he got me into it and then he showed me the Craig thing. And I was like, wow, you know, and, and at some point I must have just sat down and just watched a, a few videos and things and started getting a bit more like, oh, my God, like this. It's just so obvious that he really is Satoshi, even though the yeah. story is really complicated. Um and, and, and I could sort of tell really quickly, you know, that there were good reasons why he was hated and kind of the whole story was was always going to be a bit mysterious and, and muddled. Um, but that, it was, it was quite, so long story, it's, it, that's why I invited him. It's because it's of Sebastian Plotzenader. He, he, I saw recently, and I need to get in touch with him again, but he posted an image of Craig meeting Princess Anne. Uh, so, 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 you know, you got, you got Sebastian there sort of making things happen in the background, I guess. Yeah, so I was astounded when Sebastian said, like, he actually saw him in London and invited him to Exeter for a guest talk. And Craig said, yes, I was like, oh, my God. It's like you, you create a Bitcoin module at the same time as actually getting Satoshi to come and do a guest talk, 
even though nobody still to this day oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna say i'm gonna say 90 percent of people even after they've done my module i would say are still at least very very skeptical about the whole craig satoshi identity thing like we 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 i say we sort of yeah. talking to bsv people regularly you know you forget there's this kind of weird strange parallel universe up there Mm -hmm. where everyone thinks that still thinks that Craig is a fraud um and it's it's just really bizarre or, or maybe they just don't want to go anywhere near it they just kind of like hear about it and they're like okay yeah if I get anywhere near that it's going to really complicate what I'm doing so I'm going to stay well away from it well I think people are just really easily socially engineered is what we've discovered lately <laughs> that's that easy there's an understatement <laughs> yeah yeah, but, right. but who's socially engineering? But like, so you mean the the forces behind digital currency group, for example? You know that whole kind of BTC yeah. agenda. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. But but there's enough people that can think for themselves at, at any point in time, which is why the BSV space exists at all, really. So, you know, it over time, Craig's introduced this technology to the world. And over time, bit by bit, you know, it will filter its way in, into the broader kind of mainstream. Yep. And, and eventually people, will, I, th I think people will be fascinated by the story, but eventually, like when you're using the internet, you'll forget and you won't particularly care. You're mm -hmm. just using something that just kind of works. Yeah. And, you know, there's this weird history with these guys back in the 90s and they were all They'll fighting each other and it was all very bitter and horrible, but... Be a blockbuster yeah. movie, you know, like there was with Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch or someone playing yeah. Craig or something, you know. But, but, I mean, how can they not be? <laughs> oh, no, how, how can they not be? Yes. And who's going to play Craig? Craig will uh, play that Craig. Was, that was my question. <laughs> who's going to play all the people? <laughs> but all by the then, Craig, Craig will be, like, stepping aw We're away more and more from working. And he'll just be like, yeah. I I'll, think I'll, that will be the That man will work till he's in the grave. Who are you kidding? <laughs> I, mean, I think he's got a chance in the history books and he wants to be written correctly and he's determined to get there yeah and the smarter uh, system wins and the truth prevails eventually i'm not i'm not completely convinced that the truth prevails i mean what, what i would say is that the the underlying reality of what we're going to be doing will will be using the bitcoin technology um but I, I still think, although a lot of records will be set straight over time, and God knows, you know, in terms of does Craig sort of move into, you know, territory where in, in a legal process he's signing things and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, bit by bit, but I think there will always be, you, you know, like in, in America, I mean, th 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 there are such strong polarised versions of the truth that are constantly fighting each other that actually... You know the winners of the history writing well, uh, that's are just the people that you that's interact true, but with. But I don't mean the narrative. I mean like okay. the truth of the technology. The better system will will prevail, right? The, yeah. the story will come out whether people believe it or not, regardless which story of history prevails. I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The, the, the better, the the better will, web browser prevailed. The better search engine prevailed, right? Like yeah, exactly, <laughs> Ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The better Proof digital currency will better. prevail. For sure, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, I do agree. I just, I just relentlessly feel sorry for Craig. Yeah. Because, because I, I, I very briefly, you know, experienced kind of what it must be like. Um, oh, when, when, when he came in 2018, you know, we, we, we yeah. put the debate online, and someone emailed the VC. But like, you know, I, I said to Craig, you know, I shouldn't keep bringing it up, and I'm sorry, I've just brought it up, but it, it just means that I know that. Whatever Craig does, he's going to be attacked either way. Yeah. And I, I sense that he's made peace over time, over a long period of time, with the fact that, yeah, people will keep attacking him. Um, and sadly, you know, every now and then, you're inevitably, you're, you're, you're going to lose your temper every now and then. It's, it's kind of inevitable. Um, well, when you but, get stuck in fight mode, you're in a very aggressive mode, <laughs> right? It's not easy to step out of that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and 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 to be fair, there are so many sort of darker forces behind the other versions Amen. of Bitcoin and That's other right. cryptos that mm. 
it is a very serious ongoing battle really um yeah nefarious so and he's obviously always right in the middle of the whole thing i i don't i just don't know how he, how he does it i mean he's I very other half tries I mean, to pull him away a bit more from the whole thing strong. yeah yeah they're resilient right i mean yeah resilient so, so resilient was your Bitcoin course the first one of its kind in the UK? That, that's what I always say. That's what I was saying. I say, I, I'm, I'm, you know, you, you prove me wrong. So it's kind of hard to know. And I suppose it depends what you mean by a Bitcoin course. But yeah, I, well, I, I know. I mean, I know, I, I would you know say yes. Laura did her master's in cybersecurity and she did a section on Bitcoin, which her lecturer had to go away to study because he didn't obviously know about Bitcoin. So <laughs> I think you were groundbreaking in the respect that you were the first person to actually put a proper Bitcoin module into any university in the UK. So congratulations on that because that's yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah. That's huge. Well, thank, thank you. And I it's mean, great that that takes into a full circle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I... I I, I'm surprised at how much people have underestimated the importance of this time and again. Um, to this day, they still think it's just a, a scam, which is forgivable to some extent. But I don't think it's forgivable that loads of academics as well have just completely yeah. ignored it. And again, credit to people who have you know, started to get deeper into it. I'm noticing at the moment that there are more academics coming from sort of cryptography, different backgrounds that inevitably have you know, coming, coming through with PhDs, coming through with awareness of, of Bitcoin. Um, so again, things will start to change. And I'm sure with Robin, you know, it'd be great to talk to that guy over at Duke University at some point. I mean, just it's just good to know that other people are embracing and trying to educate in this area because it's, it's obviously the future. Um, you should tell yeah. your 700 students that they need to watch the women of BSV as homework. And then oh, they will we'll see yeah. how many entrepreneurs are actually out there and what yeah. kind of businesses that are actually being developed. Because we go quite deep with people, you know. I know. And and I was going to, even before you approached me, Dilly, I was going to say for next year, um, you know, I've got, I've got a long, long list, actually. I, was, I started writing it down just 10 minutes before coming onto this programme because there are so many people that have helped me okay do guest talks over the years i mean you know we i haven't worked out how it's going to work for, for next year but um you know let me just say quickly i mean we'll we'll if you if you want to we'll, we'll get you guys into a guest talk um for, for next year because i think that's exactly what we need more of it's, it's kind of showing people that you can build the, the, I'm already passionate yeah. about the subject anyway, but I know. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Get the women of BSV on board. We'll help educate people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, it, it's good It's good for them to see that people are being entrepreneurial and that Bitcoin SV isn't this, like, big scammy thing. Um, mm. It's actually a real thing that you can do real stuff with. It's a testament to the leadership at your college there that or university that, you know, they're fostering this thought and technology out into the world because they're, let's face it, I mean, there are a lot of instructors and professors at universities that have tenure and all this, you know, long term affiliation with their university. And then they start talking about a new technology or a new discovery and they get exiled and all their credentials taken away or refunded or whatnot so you know some of these universities aren't bringing this information into them because of the affiliations of some of the professors and people that are working in these you know universities blocking some of this stuff yeah. being put out into the education so i mean that is definitely going on in uh, higher education circles as well so um i'm yes. just really happy to see that you have a supportive you know um, structure there within your university um, that, you're absolutely right i'm glad to say that the integrity yeah. of your university yeah I, I, spot on thank you so much for saying that casey yeah i mean exactly like i've been given the freedom so so i didn't say like i was director of education and econ uh for, for quite a long time so after that my head of department kind of trusted me and, and has allowed me to, to start these new initiatives. 
and 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 that wouldn't necessarily be the case in in every university environment depending on very specific circumstances and also what i would say is you know i don't know much about sort of the interplay between industry and universities in america but like I, it concerns me that you know when you look at the digital currency group story with sort of btc bitcoin today and the fact that MIT is so heavily involved in, as far as I understand, Lightning Network research, I, th I think there is this kind of blurring inevitably. And, and by the way, I'm bracing myself for the inevitable, you know, as I get more public and involved in this, I'm bracing myself for the accusations the other way around, like, oh, Jack's been infiltrated and et cetera. You know, that, that right. will come more and more, I think, yeah. over time. The fact is, I sat down, did my own research, as you say, Casey, was allowed to then um, create new educational initiatives, which have opened up my eyes even more. And, you know, at no point have <laughs> has anyone influenced me, you know, or anyone at Exeter in Had terms of inappropriate industry yeah. collaborations or anything like that. Well, so, that's huge. That's huge in and of itself. Yeah. But then, but then the funny thing is, there's a paradox, right? Like, it would be nice to try and, like, as we said with Robin, uh, connect industry more. But again, you know, I, I've experienced, like, back in the days, we, we had this program with KPMG, the, the big consultancy. Our students were doing this accounting degree. Then they would work for KPMG for a few months each year. But everything would be paid for by KPMG. And it didn't go well. Um, it sounds great, okay, but the, the moment you get a big organisation that's private sector uh, having uncomfortable conversations with people like me around what we should be teaching, <laughs> then suddenly, like, my freedom to just kind of teach what I want to teach, is completely down to me, is suddenly compromised. It becomes a problem. And, and, and essentially, I suppose what I'm trying to say is the whole point of university in a way, is everything that people say why maybe they don't want it to exist. It's like, yes, we are an ivory tower. Like, like yes, we do just sit here in an ivory tower thinking about things independently. And I think that's a good thing. And not embedded in, in companies, big companies, yeah. Yeah, cool. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah, full credit to, to, to the team here who've, who've let me do this. And um, apologies in advance if... If, if we all get attacked in, in the coming years um, for being even even remotely connected to a Bitcoin SV and Craig. Well, you'll know it's a no. sign of success because it means more people have heard of it. So, heard of we, you, we, of course. You know. on, yes. on social media, I mean, we are constantly jibed and ridiculed. Well, tell, tell me more. Yeah. So, what know, do you think? And, and, does, and it doesn't matter to you. general ongoing thing. I mean, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. You know, in general. Not really. Yeah. If, so if people attack it, because I, I don't think I've really developed a, a thicker skin on this particular issue over time. Like if you're if you're attacked online, you just brush it off. Then did he? Like don't really care. Depends on what it is, and basically I've got hardened to it because I've been online for a very long time. I was on MySpace. Things were nice and friendly when MySpace was around. Uh, yes, when yes, Facebook yes. came along, certain things happened which were not very nice. And no, I had a good old cry. I am human at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? Things do upset mm. me. And, and these particular incidences that kept happening on Facebook, they really upset me. And I wasn't yeah. used to it. So not being used to it and having all of this just abuse thrown at you and all these things that i mm. really didn't want which are oh, illegal um mm. yeah it was really upsetting but it, 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 it depends sometimes i'm all right i can i can be calm and and yeah. but sometimes things do trigger me but that's i put it down to we are only human at the end of the day and like you say even with crate you know yeah. there are you can only hold so much in before there is a breaking point and if yeah. it's constant all the time you know i mean you you you, you Does it bubble over I, sometimes? I, I come from yeah. a drama background so what you need to understand about a drama background is that like literally when we used to 
about emotions and things, yeah, we're we're taught to express those and to let them out, whereas other places are taught to, you know, suppress them and not let them out. So I would be like, okay, well, I'll go and find a quiet field somewhere and just scream from the rooftops, right? Which is a drama exercise, voice, yeah. But yeah. obviously, if you do that and and somebody hears you who's not inevitably understanding that you're just trying to release some tension they can see that the uh, the wrong way so you know yeah yeah everyone me, needs the stress relief yeah for me i really feel like being in bsd is almost like an expanded awareness of consciousness state because you can see the world in so much like of a different vision with this technology enabling so many different things it just expands your brain and awareness so much that I almost, I really just use the mantra of like, forgive them for they know not what they do because yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. Literally, we're all just acting from a different state of awareness of what we know is possible. And it, you know, you can't even, I don't know, it's just compassion. I really, it just rolls okay. off me for the most part because we're all just like, you got to love them where they are. They just yeah. don't get it. We don't have that like literal mindgasm that occurs when you realize what bitcoin enables for a new world and for the liberation of humanity hopefully so um yeah i i mean i i think we all like have to really embody that um getting through this but i don't yeah. take any personally well well and and you know we'll talk about sbw i mean that's what that project's all about so it's it's taking the internet back to the 90s when it was all yeah. a bit nicer. Um, I mean, from the experiences that I had, all that that made me really aware of was how dangerous the whole internet is for kids. And that mm -hmm. that was like, literally, that put me on a kind of a, something needs to really change. We've got mm -hmm. a lot of misaligned incentives going on at the moment, haven't we? That's the real trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, driving... <laughs> It's not yeah. built. It's not broken. It was built this way, and so we, it's now uh, like humanity's turning point of consent. What do mm. we want? What are we going to choose? What are we going to allow? Because if we continue to allow this stuff, it's going to keep going. And that's what I love about Bitcoin FB is it literally can defund all of that bad. Stuff. And yeah. that's when we get change is when they get hit in the pocketbook and these corporations realize they're losing money. Then they shift course. So it's all tied together, the marketing, the education, the, you know, finance, the um, corporations, they're all at the highest levels orchestrating the whole thing that we're talking about the individual sectors of. So defunding that through Bitcoin SB, I think, is the greatest chance we have at um, you know, really you can't say that too loud, Casey. But it's, it's like it's true. It's going to organically happen when people are educated. They, 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 you know, or, you know, I think they organically choose to come over here versus playing in that. Yeah. Well, um, well thank, you very, thank you very much, Jack, for joining us. And um, hopefully we'll have you back at some point because uh, it'd be great to sort of keep up to date with what's going on in your course and at, at the uni and with your students and everything. Sure um, thing. And yeah, please make sure that they watch our channel for homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> homework assignment is to watch our channel once a week. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, you, you say it, you say it with a laugh, but I, I, I really will. Oh, um, I'm serious. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know, and I, I really will be. Um, I, I do already, anyway. Point out a lot of resources online that they can learn from, it, now including women of BSD. So, um, yeah, for, for, for sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and 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 happy to talk again because you know, there will be more stuff building up here at Exeter in, in the coming years. I'm, I'm sure. It's all going to be for, for the good of, of the whole BSV cool. ecosystem, as they say. Oh, well, definitely call on me and Diddy sometime. We'll come to Exeter and visit. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, you know, Joel Dalle is just down the road in Plymouth yeah. as well. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, there. we'll have some kind of big West Country gathering one day. That would yeah. be awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Jack. It's been You're an welcome. absolute joy to you. We'll talk to you again soon. Hopefully. Yes. Okay, Take awesome. Care.